Good morning. My name is John Crowley. I work with the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction Recovery, or GFDRR as we call it, at the World Bank Group. Um, much of our work, or what I'm going to talk about, is a program that Robert Soden just alluded to and, and explained some of the reasons behind. But I'm going to double click and go a little bit deeper into how it works. This is called Open Data for Resilience, and OpenStreetMap is a critical part of this. Um, first, I do want to give credit to some of the people that are in this room that made this possible. Uh, Robert. Uh, is here, Vivian is here, we have a number of other folks from the team and also folks from the wider open data group in the, the bank, including at Anderson. Um, all of this stacked into a program which now I'm going to explain uh, how you all and how some of the work that you've done with remote mapping ties directly into changing the game in disaster risk management. Let me start back in March of 2011. Uh, you'll remember the Japanese tsunami. The this is not the first time that's happened in that spot. In 869, that same type of dynamic occurred in that area. And the residents of Miyatojima crawled to the top of a hill, actually a couple hills. And unfortunately, half of them watched two, a tsunami wave come over from the sea be met by a second tsunami wave washing over rice paddies, taking away everyone on the top of that hill. They put a stone there that basically said, don't stand here. A thousand years later, the residents of Miyatojima did not flee to the top of that hill on March 11th, and therefore survived to watch two tsunami waves again meet at the top of that particular hill. That stone is a form of collective memory. It's something that allowed 50 generations of Japanese to, rem to recall the danger, the hazard, that was in that spot. It's a pretty rare occurrence to have something that's a collective memory. Think of OpenStreetMap as one. Think of it as something where we're beginning to put together the map of what could be, of the hazards that are there. Some of these hazards are really deep history, and our maps of these are quite poor. For the past 50 years, we have science. Beyond that, we have history. But geologic form, you know, phenomenon may have 100-year, 1,000-year, 100,000-year, or even a million-year cycles, or potentially more. We don't know. That invisible hazard is something that we're trying to map and trying to understand how it reacts with the human-built environment so they begin to save lives and build more resilient architecture against those hazards. The problem is that the nature of this risk is changing underneath us. Some cities are experiencing 5% growth. The population in some of the cities most exposed to climate change will double by 2050 from about 0.68 billion to about 1.5 billion. That hazard is something that we're trying to get, uh, we're trying to get ahead of and begin trying to understand how we can help. Understanding dynamic risks really requires much better data. We can't be working with 50-year-old maps and census data that might be decades old. Um, I've you know, seen a number of crises as a humanitarian where some of the best data is so old as to make you actually sit back and think, wait, you can't be serious. But it is. And some of you probably work with it and understand what I'm talking about. So in order to get there, we have essentially a process to look at risk, where we look at the hazard, the actual, what is the natural phenomenon that's going to occur, and what's the exposure of that built environment to that hazard, which leads to us to understand its vulnerability and the likelihood that it's going to be damaged. In order to get there, in order to do that, we do some impact modeling, i.e., if we have one event, what would happen? And then finally, we have something where we do risk modeling, which is the sum of many runs of many models against that particular uh, place. Our challenge is that when data is old and when data is really coarse, i.e. when we're working with 10 kilometer grid squares uh, for our estimate of vulnerability instead of building polygons, no matter how good we get with predicting our natural hazards, we're still going to come out with a really coarse model with really large error bars. So, in order to help our communities, we really need better data. And this is where open data and open street map come in. 
How many of you were part of the effort to map Haiti? Thank you. Um, the process that that catalyzed changed minds. I think there were quite a number of people who began to look and see OpenStreetMap as the potential for being able to get beyond the 10 kilometer grid square down to building polygons where we can actually begin to see the, instead of working at a city scale, we can work with neighborhoods, we can work with communities, we can work with individual people on the ground to understand their particular risks and help them be able to make themselves more legible to the, uh, the process of, of calculating how do we invest in this particular school to retrofit it against a particular type of, of earthquake or hazard. It was because of the work that happened in Haiti that an existing effort to begin working on open data and risk catalyzed into the Open Data for Resilience Initiative. This is a program that came, brought together a number of partners. At the time, really, it's, it's the GFDRR plus the regions of the World Bank plus some of the thematic groups of the World Bank working together to begin to, to pull together data. Uh, this process happened in Indonesia, and I think Kate will talk a little bit about some of the community efforts that she led there in beginning to build out data there. But we're talking about millions of building polygons being mapped, not just on, put onto a map, but their actual exposure to the built environment, to natural hazards, um, put into OpenStreetMap as, as part of a, a schema. We saw this in Nepal with Robert's work, we saw this in Sri Lanka with Vivian's work. And we began to look at how we would not only um, collect new data on the ground, but how do we unlock that data from within governments and begin to put that on open data portals as well. Because of all of this work, there came a point where we really needed to codify the practice and put it into a, basically a form that we could explain to others. And that's what I've spent the past year uh, working on with the group. And I had the privilege of basically writing this field guide, which is uh, essentially our process, our methods, our terms of reference, the data models, and a, a basic scheme, a basic under a framework uh, by which we can work on the uh, the process of collect, collecting better data about risk. We put together a roadmap. Essentially, how do we scope the project? How do we choose what we want to do to customize to local context? There is no cookie cutter with Open Open DRI. Uh, we're working on figuring out if we're going to collate data, how does that work? How do, who do in specific, what champions do we work with in government? How do we mobilize them? How do we begin to set up a process for collating that data, cleansing it, munging it, getting it into a, a data catalog and then exposing certain parts of it to the world as much as we can? Also, how do we begin to collect new data? How do we work with OpenStreetMap within a process for collecting data that we need in order to do better risk modeling, which is not the, the same as simply doing a community mapping project. This is something where we're trying to figure out how do we use a schema to collect the specific data points about uh, building lineaments, its roof type, its number of stories, uh, the beginning to understand how we would turn that into a model. And then how do we begin to catalyze the use of that around specific simple use cases and then growing that out into a larger community making use of that data to make better decisions about their risks. Let me go a little bit into how we work with governments on collating existing data, but I'll try and focus in on OpenStreetMap. We have a problem. Government data often exists. It's just fractured across a bunch of ministries and putting all those shards back together again into something that we can use is to say the least, a royal pain. It's very difficult when you have ministries which have political reasons for, for not sharing the data. At the same time, you have them locked away in proprietary systems, or worse, put into PDFs, some of which are simply scans of documents and not actually data it at all. This is a process by which uh, Vivian had worked with the government of Sri Lanka to begin to collect de better data about the tsunami. Some of you may remember Batakaloa as one of the sites in the 2004 tsunami that was absolutely devastated. Uh, in the process, the several UN agencies had come together to put together a, hazard, a great hazard guide, uh, which essentially modeled what the tsunami risks were for that particular area in a PDF. So beginning to put that into other models that we could use and calculate against the built infrastructure was a bit of a pain. But 
uh, Vivian and his counterparts in the Sri Lanka government got this uh, into the GeoNode, which is an open, open source data catalog, got it in an open data format, started working with local maps on paper, started working, digitizing them, getting them and putting them in so that we could build a model that's actually, if you, double, if you keep zooming in on that, you get down to individual buildings and their individual hazards for tsunami risk. That was not possible off the PDF. It is possible when we begin to open up the data. The collecting new data in terms of uh, what we do with OpenStreetMap, I think is what I want to spend most of the time here on. Oftentimes we have to collate data that, or collect data that is really customized to the local context. We need to be able in Kathmandu to specify that a building architecture is Noari style. That process of understanding that architecture means that we understand its vintage, we understand its general exposure to uh, hazards based on our understanding of how that was put together, and that allows us to do better modeling. But it also doesn't really blend well with traditional GIS, with traditional feature taxonomies. That process of putting together this community mapping therefore becomes one where we have to essentially have a scoping phase, decide what the data model is going to be, and work our way through uh, a collection process, mostly on paper because we're not necessarily collecting on tablets or smartphones right now, we're still doing this uh, as a paper-based process and then beginning to use data entry and teaching process of using ID or JOSM to be able to uh, put that back into OpenStreetMap. Traditionally, you know, this, is a, this is a data model that we've started to use, uh, basically build the built in for, uh, taking the building and beginning to pull it into the parts that we need in order to do better risk modeling. Uh, that gets put into a paper form. Uh, this was the one from DACA, which was part of Robert's work. And essentially putting it onto a clipboard and beginning to mark it. You notice that there's a field paper ID uh, field on the, t on the uh, top left uh, and a building number. We then use field papers to be able to, uh, in conjunction with the form, so we're able to annotate any particular building, know which of those forms go to the building by the building number and the field paper number, which allows us to do data entry. Uh, this comes into a process where we're, we teach and, and train local uh, CSOs, local civil society organizations, to begin to use the uh, OpenStreetMap. This is not expats coming in. This is how do we teach a community to curate their own data so that they're expressing their own risks and they're looking at the ex their exposure to that risk. Uh, you'll see that JOSM, we've got some of the, the, the same fields inside of there from the, the form and begin to annotate them for each building. This is led us to be able to collect millions of individual building polygons across the countries we're working in. We're working in about 24 countries now. Another key process is the QA. Uh, understanding how good that quality is is not something we do necessarily at the end. We're trying to hire engineering firms and universities to be able to provide us with an understanding of a sampling of the data so we can go through and help the people who are, who are learning in many cases to map for the first time to improve their pro data collection while they're doing it and while the pro program is scaling. They can then look at the process and begin to see what's happening. Part of Robert's work will be uh, capturing a few case studies on how this works. Uh, I think this is something we need to focus in more on so that we can ensure that our data is at the best possible quality to be able to provide the best possible risk model. Now, Building an open data ecosystem around this is often focused, like how do we get to the specific use case? Who in the champion, who in the government can't solve a problem? Oftentimes this takes the form of, we have a midterm meteorological prediction that our monsoon season is gonna be worse than normal. Which schools are gonna flood and how do I remediate against that or how do I prepare uh, better for that emergency? That was the case in Jakarta, uh, which led to the program of, of um, building out a process of uh, essentially building from the use case, uh, i.e. a flood, to building better data quality. This is Kate's work on building out better data on some of the, the work, some of the, um, basically of the building polygons. Making that data available in OpenStreetMap, making some of the other data available through portals, building the community around it, and then applying it through risk models and impact models. Another key component just got launched, uh, was it a week and a half ago? I think it was about 10 days ago, is the new InnoSafe tool, uh, which allows us to, essentially the impact model, it's open source software, plug in for QGIS, specify, pull in, I want to pull in OpenStreetMap data for Jakarta. I want to use the midterm meteorological prediction from this other URI. 
and I want to be able to run a model and tell me which schools are going to flood. This allows you to do that by drop down, pulling in the data from each of those resources and then running an impact model which now you can visualize in a simple form and hand this to a local provincial uh, disaster manager. This field guide that we put together is a 1.0. It's intended to be a scaffolding to be replaced. Um, it is something where it's CC BY, where I'm going to put the, the text up in GitHub so it's editable and forkable. Um, and I hope that you all will be able to, to help us understand how do we improve this process. How do we better understand how to be able to pull this together? A thought I'd like to leave you with is that the collective memory is something that we need to build. It's not just about what is, and it's not just about um, what might become our past. It's something where we can begin to express what might no longer be there. The people of Syria are currently experiencing that. They've left. There is no place where their map expresses where things were. That process of putting that together from satellite imagery today, we can do it, try and do it remotely. We can use archival imagery. We can use current imagery. But understanding what was there is actually something that might be lost. We're looking at being able to for a disaster, be able to put together this collective memory so people can begin to think about not only what once was, but what could also be and what could be built back stronger and what could be built back more resilient. This is the power of OpenStreetMap that we're just beginning to realize and it's a power that you all have in your hands. I hope you all join us. Um, I'm free to take questions. Uh, I hope that uh, the guide is, is useful to you and please edit it. Thank you.